there were some beavers raised in captivity. The parents had been killed. And they were very young when they were taken by the wildlife rescue people. And as they got older, became adults. It came time to release them back into the wilderness. <coughs> and the rescuers were concerned. Would they know how to build a dam? Would they know how to build a lodge? So they released them into a stream. And sure enough, very quickly, first thing they thought about was building a dam, then a lodge. It was instinctive. In the same way, our minds are very instinctive about creating states of becoming. We create little worlds, and then we take on an identity in those worlds. And as the worlds fall apart, or our identity falls apart, we create new ones. We keep at it. This is how the mind occupies itself, how it uses its imagination to figure out what to do. But it's also why we suffer. Because all those becomings are based on craving. And as the Buddha said, wherever there's craving that leads to becoming, there's going to be suffering. So the purpose of the meditation is to learn how to un unlearn that habit. This is why when the Buddha gives his instructions for concentration, which are actually in the description of right mindfulness. It's how you do the concentration. There are two activities. One is to stay focused on one thing in and of itself, and the other is to put aside greed and distress with reference to the world. What this is going to require is you put aside all references to the world while you're sitting here. You want to be just awareness and breath. And that's going to be becoming enough. And sure enough, the mind will start creating little becomings, just like those beavers building dams. But you want to nip them in the bud. You have to see, what is it that goes into those becomings? The Buddha said there are two of the aggregates that are especially, especially active in shaping the mind, shaping these becomings, their feelings and perceptions. And you want to learn how to deconstruct them. This is a really important part of the meditation. A world begins to form in the mind, and you have to destroy it. Now that is, engaging in craving for non-becoming. But you're going to find the right balance between craving for becoming and craving for non-becoming. By learning how to engage in both skillfully. Like your craving for becoming right now is aimed at creating a state of concentration. Craving for non-becoming, you want to learn how to focus on doing away with everything that would lead to new concepts of the world, perceptions of the world. Any perception of the mind right now that tells you where you are in the world, who you are in the world, see if you can shred it, turn it inside out. Dogen has a term for this. He says it's de-thinking your thinking. And here you're engaged in deep perception. The Thais have an interesting insight into perception. The word per perception, sanyang, is also used for agreement, contract. And there's an agreement in the mind that this is going to mean that, and that's going to mean this. And what you've got to learn how to do is undo the agreement. An image forms, and you, and you learn how not to recognize it. Something that would normally key you into another world. You say, nope, I don't recognize that. You can think of the breath breathing right through it. 
that one of the Tayajans liked to have the image of a knife. The perception forms and you slash it. Another one forms and you slash it. Anything where any connection comes up, you slash right through it with a knife. Because you're changing your frame of reference. You need to change your frame of reference if you're going to see what's going on in the mind. Because if you allow your frame of reference to be the world, there are certain things that make sense in terms of the world, certain values, and they're not the values you want right now. If you adopt that context, you adopt that frame, the ways of the world make sense. You want to make them not make sense right now. Look at them with new eyes. That's why we stay with the breath in and of itself, the body in and of itself. Try to keep a low profile, fly under the radar. Don't let clouds of abstractions build up, because they do turn into becomings. So stay close to the sensation, and you'll realize, of course, that Perceptions play a role in this, too, in keeping you with the breath in and of itself. How you perceive the breath will have a huge impact on how you experience it. In other words, the way you label it, the pictures you have in your mind about the breath will have a huge impact on how the breath actually flows. So you want to experiment to make sure that this alternative frame is interesting, engaging, a really pleasurable place to be. So you try out different perceptions of the breath. You can try John Lee's, the perceptions that he recommends in Method 2. Or you can try the perceptions he recommends in some of his Dharma talks. He's got a wide range of perceptions. He talks about breath sensations that go up, breath sensations that go down, those that spin in place, those that go back and forth. See if these concepts, these perceptions help. You can think of the breath coming in the soles of the feet and going up through the spine. Or you can think of it starting at the base, base of the skull and going down the spine. One perception I found helpful is of not having to drag the breath through the body. Tell yourself, as soon as you start breathing in, the breath has already gone throughout the whole body, throughout the whole nervous system. It's that fast, that subtle. And just hold that perception in mind and see what happens. The point here is that we're not trying to get after the most objective perception of the breath. Because it turns out there are lots of different ways you can perceive it. The objectivity we're looking for is the objectivity of cause and effect. In other words, you try this perception, you get those results. You try another perception, you get different results. Which is better? Because a lot of insight is as I've been saying many times, is a value judgment as to what's worth doing. So which perceptions are worth doing? And if you run into a perception that's not worth doing, you shred it. You de-perceive it. Question it. Turn it inside out. And you can see this most effectively. You can test this most effectively when you don't get into the framework of the world. As soon as you start thinking about the world, there's the duties that have to be done out there, things you have to worry about, things that are important in the context of the world. But right now we're trying to establish a different importance. So if the mind wanders back to the world, okay, try to shred those perceptions. Work on the perceptions that help you stay grounded here in the breath in and of itself, making this your framework. 
because then you get to see perceptions in and of themselves, feelings in and of themselves, simply as they're directly experienced, simply as you engage in them. When we say that we experience these things, we experience them through doing them. It's not that we're simply on the receiving end. The Buddha's analysis of the aggregates. Remember that? For the sake of feelingness, for the sake of perceptionhood, you fabricate a feeling, you fabricate a perception. In other words, there's a raw material there from your past karma. You t turn it into actual feelings, actual perceptions. So there's an intentional element there, so learn how to use that intentional element to experiment. As I said, to get not to the objectivity of the best perception of the breath, but the truest perception of the breath, but the objectivity of cause and effect. This perception has that effect. That that perception has this effect. After all, as you get the mind into concentration, you'll be dealing with perceptions in every level up through the dimension of nothingness is a perception attainment. So get to know perceptions well. And they're useful not only for concentration, they're also useful for discernment. You look at what the Ajahns have to say about their practice. When you're working with pain, the big issue is perception. When you're working with lust or pride around the body and trying to see the unattractiveness of the body, the issue is the perception. Why is it that you can go from perceiving the body as unattractive to back to being attractive very quickly? Who hijacked the perceptions? So of all the aggregates, this seems to be the most central in the teachings of the Forest of Johns. And you can make it central in your own practice by learning how to play with it. Because the mind is very much shaped by the labels it applies to things. And so be very careful about which perceptions you ride with as you try to stay focused on the breath in and of itself, and which perceptions you have to de-perceive, to take apart, to turn inside out. This is something you learn through trial and error, through experimenting, to the point where you get to trial and success. You gain your range of perceptions to help the mind settle down, help you gain insight. And you've mastered the skills of taking apart any perceptions that are unhelpful or actually get in the way. That's when you really can start counteracting that tendency to create little worlds and go traveling in them. willy-nilly. You learn how to create a world here around the breath. Inhabit this world for the time being. And learn how to take apart everything else. So as we de-perceive, we're, we're deconstructing, decontextualizing as well. As I said, certain values make sense in the context of the world, but then when you see them simply as mental events in and of themselves, they don't make sense anymore. When you see that, you begin to see the way that you can get yourself free from them. <laughs>